Hey there, welcome to a brand new episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and in this week's vlog you will see my in-depth interview with Ricky Simmons and Steve Jones about their project The Space Brothers. Enjoy! The Space Brothers is probably the most well-known project from UK-based duo Ricky Simmons and Steve Jones. Some other projects of the guys are Chakra, Lustral, Oxygen, Force Majeure, Ascension, Essence, Ultra High and many many others. In the year 1997 they started their project The Space Brothers. The very first single they released under that name was the track Shine. Shine became very successful and it peaked all kinds of dance charts straight away. It even made it into the UK chart. Plus P Tong named it his essential new tune as well. For this week's vlog I sat down with Ricky and Steve to ask them about the story behind The Space Brothers and more. My first question to them was how they got to meet each other. Right, so we met each other, um, I was in a band, a rock band. You were friendly with a friend of my brother's. Correct. My brother was the drummer in the band. Your friend was John Beck, who was a friend of Danny's, my brother. And you were kind of doing some recording with John Beck and then where we were rehearsing, we were rehearsing every day each week in this barn at the guitarist's parents' house. And then you ended up coming up and just kind of we came over to the equipment going, oh, what's all this? No, no, actually, what, what happened was we had the guitarist that I was working with broke his E string, and there was it was Sunday, there was, no, there was no shops open, so he phoned up the guitarist in Rick's band and said, Look, do you mind if you pop over and uh, I borrow an E string off you? So we're doing some recording. He said, Oh, yeah, come up. So I came up with him and Kate crashed their rehearsals, yeah. And we kind of and you were kind of like he was just checking out all the equipment, like, what's that? It must have like, what's this guy want? <laughs> they, need, they needed a keyboard player. They, we had, did. they had no keyboard. Yeah. I was a keyboard player. It's like, what are you doing? Oh, okay, well, I wouldn't mind. Yeah, let's join the band. Yeah. So. And that's it. And the rest, as they say, is boring. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, what, what year are we talking about now? This, uh, this is 1989, isn't it? Yeah. A long time ago. Gosh. That's actually 30 years ago. Now. Wow. Jesus, oh, congratulations. Yeah. Muzzle top. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Lovely to see you again. Well, I didn't think about, right, well, you know. I didn't think about this 30 yeah. years thing. It's a 30 year anniversary. Yeah. God, blind. Yeah. So you, you both have... Think, though, doesn't it? Yeah. Sorry, carry on. Oh, you look all yeah. right, you know. Well, you know. You, you both have a musical background? Yeah, I, I mean, do you want to go first? I, st I was started DJing when I was about 15. And, and then taught myself to play piano around 19. So no, no kind of formal training. But I had my Atari, my trusty Atari, which we did all our records with, sort of from the age of about 19, playing video games on it. And I realized you could run Cubase on it and started uh, started writing and making music. So yeah, just 15 onwards, really. I, yeah, I, I started a bit earlier. I was doing piano lessons when I was seven, but I hated it. I remember the teacher kind of like smacking my knuckles when I got something wrong. I was only seven, so quite a sensitive lad. So I quit that, but I still like music. And then in the early 80s, when I was probably about 13, 14, I was really getting into bands like Depeche Mode, Human League. And I bought myself, I think it was probably a Roland, or was it a Juno? It was a Roland Juno 60. It was a Juno yeah. 60, yeah. Also. So I had that, I'd also had a core micro preset before that, but that was pretty crap, because you can only play one note at a time. So I got into that and then I started having more lessons. Started trying to write songs when I was about 13, 14. Uh, and then by the time I was in my late teens, that's when we started this band that he gate crashed. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you decide to start working on music together? Well, pretty much as soon as Steve joined the band in 89, um, that was quite a long time, wasn't it? It was about a two, two, years. two year stretch that we had. Then the band, um, we didn't split up. A um, couple of the members of the band went over to New York to try and look for a, a deal for us. And that coincided with us getting lost in a field, uh, dancing for about six months. So yeah. the two things kind of, uh, the two competing things where we were getting into dance music and the band was slowly not really getting a deal, made us kind of fall into dance music. And then from there, we started kind of working on other stuff together. We were in another band and all the other projects that we end up doing followed from there. Yeah, that was that was 1991. So we had, uh, yeah, we had six months hiatus where we had nothing to do. So we went to rain dance and uh, discovered dance music. Yeah. 
we went to the park first yeah, in Kensington. We did, yeah, we did, yeah. So, do you guys remember the very first track you, you did together, like as a re official release? As an official release, it was probably, you'd probably say Gem 77, but it was probably, <laughs> the good, it was probably a white label of The Good Strawberries. This mm. band, we were, wasn't it? Yeah. Climb the Tree, would that have been the first one? Yeah. First official release no, that we were it, both on together? It was a white label, it was a record we pressed up ourselves. So we got the record cut, pressed up 2,000 copies, put them in the back of my car and drove around London selling them out to the record shops. So that was that was the start of it. That's how you used to do it. Not official as in record company release, but independent release. And we did probably half a dozen records like that. Oh. Yeah. Um, so in 1997, you guys came up with a project you decided to call the Space Brothers. Can you tell us a bit more about this? So we'd already done Chakra. Well, we'd done Ultra High before that, um, but we were kind of busy with Chakra. And then I can't remember how we had we already written Shine to start with, or no, we hadn't read it. Yet. Yeah, please do because I can't remember. <laughs> so we'd finished Chakra. That was the first kind of trance <laughs> record after. After being massively inspired by the the Goa mix on on Radio One, the Oakenfold had done one. We kind of wrote Chakra the next day, as we've said in a previous interview. But so we wrote Chakra, and we went to the Miami Music Conference, and um, we were there oh, yeah. with our publisher, Coming Chrysalis to. Music, and stuff, and our A and R guy, John Dickens from Warner Brothers, and we were just there just to soak up the atmosphere and stuff. And one of Ricky's friends, who's a Trance Channeler from New York. Should I explain Trance Channeler? Because he, because of trance music, you could suddenly okay, get this. Go on then. Sounds like a radio host. Go on, you can, you can take this. So, bit. okay, so without wanting to get a bit weird about it, so this girl that I knew through someone else, she was a Trance Channeler, and essentially that means, uh, I'm not joking, I'm just, you know, it's, it sounds like I'm messing about, but she basically goes into a trance and is inhabited by spirits, and spirits talk to her. Um, really high level kind of woman in that way um so she we were kind of sitting with her and she said you know want to have a chat with you like messages are coming through and she ended up telling us you know what these spirits were saying and this was all this was all in uh it was all this in the all grass around, this in miami. Was all, all around the pool at the fontainebleau hotel <laughs> fontainebleau hotel in miami beach while the conference is going on, she said, I need to give you a reading in the, in, in the bushes quickly. So the three yeah. of us went in there, sat down, and she said, listen, just take, take what I'm going to say, just take the good bits, but I need to get this stuff off because it's been driving me mad for a few days. So she said, look, this." she gave us a, some really positive messages about our music and stuff, and, and towards the end of it, Ricky asked her what uh, who these people we were talking to what what they what their names were what do we call you and they said you can call us the Space Brothers and so uh, after that Ricky said well you know what that's a great name we're going to have to use that at some point about that yeah. and I'm kind of laughing because it's kind of like you know anyone listening might think oh god this sounds like a bit of a piss take but you know I take it seriously you know there's there's definitely something in it um, that's all I'll say so and it was quite a heavy profound type of experience um, but take of it what you will kids you know we've all got our own views on these things what's for sure is the message came right though because she was just at spreading a uh, speed and she was just spreading positivity explaining that you know that your music will have an effect on people and at that time we hadn't really had any hits or anything like that or any success so ironically you know just her giving us the positive energy ended up actually meaning something so pretty cool name as well yeah so the first release you guys did as the space brothers was the track shine uh, that one made it to the number 23 position of the uk top 40 back in 1997 and uh, that was a pretty good start of the project right very good so i couldn't have hoped for more really and we were on a really strong label at the time manifesto who uh, um judge jules had been head of a and r he was still there but luke neville had kind of taken over from him um, and they would, they'd had a really good run of hits, so we were really pleased to be with them. And they just really worked hard at, you know, making sure that records were connected. So yeah, it was a good, really good start. I mean, interesting enough that, again, that track, we only had the chorus written, didn't we? And it was Jules that said, can you put some verses on it? Extra oh, vocal. actually. Yeah, we only had four four lines in the, in the that's song. That's true, yeah. It started off as a more kind of, um, just just a chorus really yeah just um, the soul of an angel touched from above just that part with the riff 
the rest of it was just instrumental and then Jewel said just be really good to have some some verses and expand on the lyric and the idea and so they they came afterwards we added those afterwards yeah so you had to go back there uh, write lyrics well funny enough, I mean thinking about it I'm crap at remembering things I think I did have I think you did I, have I think I had written. lyrics written for it but we'd only decided to just use these kind of four lines because it just felt like the kind of record where you had the four lines but I, I remember when he asked for more, but it wasn't like, okay, what do we do for verse? I had a load of stuff that I'd written as a whole. So it was good to kind of think, okay, I can use everything. Cause I, cause I did base it on something. I'd seen a documentary um, on TV, uh, which was, it was, you know, a really kind of heavy subject, which was all about um, these two little girls who were born as conjoined twins. And it was a documentary about this Irish family, how, they had to make this decision whether they go for this operation. And I think there were only about six or seven of these girls. And the operation was high risk and they might end up losing one of the children, but they had to do it. And it was just so inspiring because they had, uh, the whole thing about surrounded by love was because of the love this family had throughout the process. And tragically, one of the twins died, but the love that this family had, you, you know, it just came through. Um, in this documentary and that's what I wrote the song about so it was nice to you know in subsequent years to kind of get the response always because it came from you know a really emotional place mm -hmm. yeah um, so for the Space Brothers project you guys worked with a, with a few different singers why was that? Different. Steve ended up falling out of all of them <laughs> <laughs> uh. No. You, know, you know, some of the songs, well, like Heaven Will, Heaven Will Come, for instance, was written, I think, with Chakra in mind. So that had Kate on it, naturally. Then we had uh, Grace, Dominique Atkins. She sung a couple of tracks on there. She was going to sing Legacy, as I remember, but she said she couldn't do it. She, was, she found the lyrics so emotional that she said, I, I really can't sing it. So Kate sung that. Um, and who and then, well, then, well, then obviously Joe did two of the bigger songs which was yeah. Shine and Forgiven um, but I think when we we knew that we were going to do an album for it and because we'd had these other songs like Heaven Will Come which was you know first started as quite a downbeat song we had these songs like Your Place in the World which Dominique did um, we knew that we weren't going to be doing an album where they were all you know 12 kind of uh, club-tastic songs there was going to be all these different almost genre, like a genre def defying approach so because we were being quite eclectic with the sounds and the styles of each song, it just followed that we decided to use different singers just to kind of make make it sound like... Just different tones, really. So, yeah. So like we, for our, our, our thought was the Space, space Brothers of the two of us. We wanted to use different singers because they'd have a, bring a completely different approach and a different tone to the record and differentiate between the two, the, you know, the, the styles and the, the sound of the track, really. And he fell out with all the singers. And I fell out with all the singers. <laughs> so, uh, you guys are responsible for like a lot of tracks that came out under project names such as Chakra, Nostril, Oxygen, Essence, Force Majeure, Ascension, and of course, The Space Brothers. What was the reason behind having so much different aliases? It was definitely a practical reason. Um, the main reason was because when we were working with a lot of these record companies at the time, we'd uh, deliver a song and it would sometimes be about six months wouldn't it before a track would come out I think I am was a year yeah it would take yeah. that long because you, was, yeah. you know unlike nowadays there was this long kind of marketing campaign that went went into it and a kind of club uh, specialist campaign all these different elements to a marketing campaign that you don't have as quite a long process nowadays so that's what was going on and we were we, you know, we were just going through a really prolific period. So if we would have just said, you know, literally one project, we would have been waiting so long to get all this material out. So it was really for that reason. But then it kind of worked to our advantage because, like we were just saying before, if we've got one project that's not quite, you know, it's not straight down the line trance, maybe a bit more down tempo stuff, like the Lustral project ended up being an album that had so many different styles. It meant we didn't have to kind of worry about schedules of like that has to be the single for that one etc yeah. makes sense um so how, how did you choose which sound to associate with which alias 
You used to be good I've got this. a really weird thing. I, I, d- I did it by colour. So chakra is, to me, the act, the act chakra is green. The Space Brothers is red and Lustra is kind of yellow. And the sound, yellow, red is more uplifting. So the Space Brothers is always a slightly more uplifting hands in the air sounds. Chakra to me was more melancholy and deeper and slightly more, yeah, a sadder sound, a deeper sound. And uh, and Lustral was more sunset. It always sounded like you could put anything on there. It was always breakbeaty and more chilled. Yeah. So that was the There's vibe. a word for this, isn't there? Isn't it synesthesia? Synesthesia. Yeah, there you That's go. That's when people, they yeah. see things in colour. Colour. Yeah. So you probably got a mild version of that. So when I was, when I was producing the records, if without even knowing what project we'd have them on because I'd have the colour in my mind then it would make it sound like a chakra record so you know Love Shines Through sounds like home they belong to the same thing but you wouldn't put Love Shines Through with Forgiven they don't they sound like different projects mm-hmm. so to me Forgiven is red and Love Shines Through is green Nurse <laughs> <laughs> does that make any sense at all yeah, yeah it makes okay sense. yeah but yeah, it was just, it's just because there's different feelings uh, and, yeah, and and yeah. yeah and we, we i wanted to make sure the projects had the right the tracks had the right the, went to the right project for the yeah. feeling we were trying to get across you know so was the space brothers your most successful project i think it probably is actually i mean mm. it might not be have the most successful single that might be every time mine that yeah the every, last yeah. song but as an overall project um in terms of you know the whole catalogue, I'd probably say we've released the most singles on it, and we've had the most chart success with it. So yeah. the sales are the biggest for yeah. the, for the project, but every time has got a, just a mind of its own that that sells forever. It also, seems. everyone always you, you know we're known as the Space Brothers now, but even in those early kind of days when we were releasing various things, people will always just talk about us as the Space Brothers, oh. who happen to be. Chakra Ascension. It was never the other way around. Mm. So all the remixing was always as the Space Brothers. Yeah. All the dubs on the other side of the other records were the Space Brothers dubs. So we just we kept it to try and keep it as a. That's what we are. Yeah. And after the, after what we've told you about Miami, when okay, so it made sense that we had to stick as the Space Brothers. We were told we had to. Yeah. yeah. So which track of the Space Brothers is the most special for you? I for me, I'd say Shine for. Kind of for the reasons I've given, because it, you know, was quite an emotional background to where this, why the song came about. But also the other reason, without wanting to be too heavy about things, um, we've had, you know, quite, quite a handful. When I say quite a handful, handful of people over the years who have told us that they've used that song at funerals, and it's really, you know, it's just a really touching thing to hear that, you know, in the most difficult time of someone's life, they've used a song that we've written for some kind of small source of comfort. So that's quite moving to hear that. For me, uh, yeah, Shine, just because the effect it has on people and just the effect, because it was the first big one we had going to Cream and seeing the effect on the crowd, that was amazing. But yeah. I love I love the vocal delivery and the message with Heaven Will Come. I love the, just the, I love the way Kate sung that and I love the, the message in the, in the lyric and I love the lyric in Legacy. So that yeah. makes you happy, right? I'm definitely happy, and I'm happy with Legacy because I wrote that about my mum and dad. Yeah. So, so, I know, so like, I, know, I know that, and I, I love the message in it. It's, it's yeah. a beautiful lyric. It's touching, you know. Yeah. Um, so, in 2004, uh, you guys did play a major role in the digital music revolution by founding the dedicated dance download store, AudioJelly.com. Uh, I actually do remember buying a lot from Audio Jelly in the time I was still working for a local radio station. So, how did you guys came up with the idea to make a download portal dedicated to dance music? Um, it came from, we, we, I'd read an article by Eddie Gordon, who used to run Manifesta, um, and he was like enthusing or evangelizing about the new uh, iTunes store, and just saying, really kind of giving a bit of an essay about it before anyone knew too much about it, about how it was going to change everything and revolutionize how we all get our music. So we were reading that at the time, and at the time this is when the internet was starting to hit sales, labels were starting to be very panicked. So with the two things combined, it just gave us the idea that, okay, maybe this is the way we should think about selling our stuff. And it kind of snowballed from there where it first became a thing where we'd, you know, at the time it sounds natural now to have an online label, but the idea of a virtual label, it's like, God, that would be really weird. 
But then when we started putting it together, loads of friends and colleagues in the industry heard about what we're doing and just said, oh, can we sell our catalogue through you guys? So it then turned from what might have been an online label to start with into a shop. And yeah, you know, we were kind of there at the beginning when the likes of DJ Download, obviously Beatport, and Track It Down, they were kind of like the big four of us who were starting at the same time. Who was the store that, that launched, launched before that? The another American one? Tracks, was it Track Source were first? Track Source were... Were they the I think, first one? No, I think Beatport might have been first, if okay. I've got that right. Uh, we were track, about three months I think Track after, Source right? was slightly after Audio okay. Jelly. I think we were like second or third. Yeah. Something like that. So like in the beginning, I think it was a lot of uh, your own releases, but later you guys also offered music from other labels as well. Uh, at one point there was music from over 4,000 different labels. Was it a lot of work to manage all of this? It was a lot of work, a hell of a lot of work. I mean, it did get out of control really. It kind of took over where it was kind of competing with our time to work on music a lot of the time. So there was a real kind of tension about how we kind of balance it out. Um, it was good fun though. It was good. It was a good thing to do because it felt like an exciting thing to do, to have that kind of freedom to get your music out there, which is taken for granted now. Um, but yeah, it was just a little bit too, too much of a monster that got out of control. Yeah, it, it, it did become a real beast when 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 we started getting catalogue delivered, which just huge catalogue, and the labels quite rightly just wanting the whole thing online overnight. It's just to 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 get the catalogue online just to manage it all was like phew. yeah we weren't set up you know we weren't we didn't have enough resource to to do it after a while we got it we got it streamlined and things are but it's it's it cost an awful lot of money we we had i think the peak seven or eight people working on it full time so yeah so yeah i guess uh, running audio jelly and producing music was a full-time job for you then yeah definitely full-time <laughs> yeah more than full-time yeah it was a bit of a headache to be honest yeah. There have been some releases from the Space Brothers in 2014 and 2015. Uh, can we expect some brand new material from the Space Brothers anytime soon? Yep, we're working on uh, four tracks in the pipeline. Uh, we've done a collab with Sue McLaren and her other project Siskin uh, with uh, Suzanne Chesterton. Uh, we've got a collab with two, sorry, two collabs with uh, Darren Tate yep. on the go as well. So yeah, four new tracks coming. And a Space Brothers track in its... Uh, on its own. Oh yes. yeah, yeah. Forgot about that. So one. yeah. And that's all gonna be released this year? Hopefully. Okay. If I can pull my finger out and finish <laughs> <laughs> So besides translated projects, you are also responsible for music for TV series such as The Sopranos. And you also did the music for movies such as Swordfish, for example. How different is it for you to work on music for TV and movies compared to work on a trans track? Well the Sopranos was sh was shine that was on there so that was already done okay so that was just a pure license job they did on us and what was the scene it was a wonderful scene it's when <laughs> uh, when meadow took her first e so and it's, it was our favorite right, show yeah. at the time and for her to it's come great. up on ecstasy listening to shine was just one of the best things i've ever seen so that was a, that was a done deal uh sawfish that was with you and yeah that was a uh, yeah that was, was that? a track called either out of my mind or off my tits or something like that. I can't remember what it's called. Um, that was with, yeah, it was, oh, you did yeah, that was, yeah, it was on a, it was a perfecto uh, yeah. signing. So that was really just a license, but that, yeah, that was quite an exciting thing to be on. Um, that was a John Travolta movie, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. The, yeah. the, the, the one f Lost in Space, which is a track we did under the name The Realm. That was fun to do. That was done for Manumission, Man Manumission. the movie, which was like a famous, movie at the time because it got banned you know because it was because you can imagine the content in a manumission movie uh but it was also good because mike and claire um asked us to go out for about four days and do a cameo because it was all it was almost like this kind of weird road trip type of film so we kind of spent some time driving around with them and all the kind of staying. really uh, staying at the manumission motel which uh. For anyone who went to the Manumission Motel will know that that was the most extraordinary motel that's ever existed <laughs> on planet Earth. Um, so yeah, so that was really good. And we, it, that was a pleasure to do because we wrote this track called Lost in Space where we detailed the, they always used to have this after party called Carry On at Space on the Tuesday morning after the Monday night um, 
their weekly party. So we, in the lyrics, talk about you know some of the stuff that was going on, uh, the madness of it. So that that was a good thing yeah. to do. But so that was written specifically for Mike and Claire and, and about space, and it was that was great fun. It was unusual track as well because it was kind of slow hip hop breakbeat, which is not what they expected. They thought we were going to come back with this big uplifting space brothers record and yeah because funny enough they were they were a massive fan of shine and that's the reason they asked us to do it because they they'd fallen in love with that track so they thought we might just do something silly uh, similar but yeah. we did something silly that's how it worked out <laughs> yeah it sounds great so, so besides the space brothers are there any other projects or things that you're working on right now we have a little side project that i'm doing with a friend of ours called sub sapiens which is, uh, yeah, which is sounds a little bit like Lustral mixed with The Beloved. It's quite alternative, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit yeah. alternative. That's quite fun. It's yeah. very melodic. It's really cool. Mm. Is it like vocal? Yeah, I'll play some after yeah. this. Okay, <laughs> um, the guy singing is a guy that's always worked on a lot of our tracks yeah, and he's... engineering on our tracks. Yeah. Okay. Really talented guy called Aiden Love. So is there still something on your bucket list, music-wise? What about you? Have you got anything? I'm waiting for you. <laughs> um, bucket list. Hey, what I you think. Wanna, what do you want to do? Uh, there's nothing. Like pyramid stage at Glastonbury. You want to do I'd that? love to do that. There you I'm go. I'm doing that. Um, I would love to. I'd love to do something with the chemical brothers. Actually, I don't. I don't know what on earth we do with them. Uh, maybe if there was ever a chance of doing something with them, maybe it'd just be a really weird song, but. I've always loved the Chemical Brothers. They were kind of they were an act that blew my mind when I first saw them live, probably about 25 years ago. Um, so yeah, if it was a wish list or a bucket list thing, I'd probably say do a track with them. Yeah, I'll okay go with that. Yeah, I'm happy with that one. And the last question: pineapple on pizza? Yes or no? Yes. And it's got to be from Pizza Hut. Absolutely which, not. Yeah, that's the thing that you said. No, I'm not having this. And nobody likes Pizza Hut. Even I don't like Pizza Hut, <laughs> but I do like the Hawaiian at Pizza Hut. Good. Uh, Count me in. All right, thank you very much for your time and good luck with everything. Thank, thank you good. very much. Cheers. Cheers. Well. <laughs> <laughs>